Pastor Lau and Pastor Dala Haprasit would like to welcome you to the following message from New Hope International Church in Seattle, Washington. Here is Pastor Lau's anointed teaching that will change your life with love, hope, and peace in Jesus Christ. And now, Pastor Lau. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word today. We thank you for teaching your people, and your word will renew our mind. Help us to have the mind of Christ. Oh Lord, we want to be doers of the word, not just hearers. And Lord, we want to be that house that was built on the rock, that hear the word and practice the word of God. And when a storm, a rain, or the wind blows, when the storm comes, the house will stand to the end. Thank you, Father. We want to be that kind of church, the church on the rock that knows the word and practices the word of God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. This teaching is a second part continuation from last Sunday. Last Sunday, we were talking about closing the door of the curse and walk into the life of blessing or life of victory. Let me read many scriptures to review again before I go into the second message here. Galatians chapter 4 verse 7. Therefore, you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. In John chapter 16, verse 23, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most actually I say to you, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, He will give you. John chapter 15, verses 14 to 15, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, For a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. Last Sunday, we learned that in order to live a life of victory, a life of blessing, that the curse from generation to generation cannot take advantage of us or cannot control us anymore. We need to know who we are and the right we have in Christ Jesus. And the conclusion from last Sunday is that we need to know that we are a son and a daughter of God. It's a privilege to be a son and a daughter of God. Amen? Like my son and my daughters have the privilege to live in my house, to open the refrigerator in my house without asking me for permission. They can go to vacation with me. They don't need to ask me, can I go to vacation with you? They can stay with me in vacation It's a privilege to be a son and a daughter of God. And the privilege that God and the right that God has given to us is the right to use the name of Jesus. And that name is above all names. That name that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. So we are, as a believer, a son and a daughter of God. And we need to recognize that. And not only that, we can use the name of Jesus to fight against the enemy. Not only God call us a son, but more than that, as the king of the kings of the universe, as the Lord of all lords, he called us a friend. He said, you are my friend. When a king calls somebody friend, it means that he gives the authority. He said that if somebody bothers you, let me know, I take care. I will send my army to take care of that. So we are all, as a believer, a son of God. We all have the right and privilege to use the name of Jesus. And as we walk in obedience, doing what God tells us to do, not my will, but your will, then what happens? We become a friend of God as well, a friend of the king of all kings. And then we have the authority and privilege on earth here to command the curses, to command the enemy to go away from our life, and we can walk in the blessing of God. Amen. Everyone know your position now. Everyone say, I am a son or daughter if you are a woman. You are a son of God. They say, I am a son of God. I have the right to use his name. I am a friend of God. And we can do all these things not because we deserve it, not because we are good looking, because we have high education, or because we are smart, go to Bible school, and know a lot of Bible. We have all this right and the position because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Last Sunday, we learned that Jesus shed his blood at six places. And we learned only one place last Sunday, and the time was over. And last Sunday, we learned from 
the book of Isaiah 53 verses 4 to 5. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. Last Sunday, we learned that Jesus shed his blood at the whipping post, and every time the Roman soldier hit his back altogether 39 times. The blood came out and that blood that was shed from his back was for the breaking of the curse of sickness. So by his stripe, by his blood, we have the right to be healed. God's healing is the privilege of Christian because it's a promise of God. It was done for us who believe in the name of Jesus. Everyone say healing belongs to Christians. We all, as believers, have the right to receive the healing from God, supernaturally, supernatural healing of God by the stripe of Jesus Christ. So we're going to learn five more places that Jesus shed his blood today. Amen? Six places. And each place gives us something, gives us a blessing and cut off something. Last Sunday, we learned that by the blood of Jesus Christ, we were redeemed. The word redeemed means ransomed. I watched a movie long time ago about a young boy was kidnapped in Mexico by bad guys. And the father hired somebody to try to get the boy back to his home. When a boy was kidnapped, he lost the security, the protection, and the provision of his home by the father. But when the father paid the money, he was brought back into the home of food, clothing, security, and protection back to the original condition. The father paid a ransom. So the word redemption or redeemed by the blood of Jesus is not just forgiveness of sin. Thank God for the forgiveness of sin. But Jesus paid to take us back to the original condition, the place of protection, security, provision, and love in his hand. How do we know where we should go by the redemption of the blood of Jesus Christ? We look back to the book of Genesis chapter 1 and 2. The original plan of God is in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 before Adam sinned against God. In the Garden of Eden, there was no poverty. There was no lack. There was no sickness. There was no broken relationship. There was no curse. There was no hardship. There was no drug addicts. There was no cancer. There was no discrimination. In the Garden of Eden, before sin entered into the world, there was perfect condition. There was no need at all, no lack at all. And that's what Jesus paid the price for us. He shed his blood for us so that we can get into the book of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 again, the Garden of Eden. And we receive this by faith. He did it by grace. And we receive by faith. And faith come by hearing and hearing of the word of God. Amen. That's why we need to preach the word of God so that you have faith. Let's look at the second place where Jesus shed his blood. The second place was on his head. The Roman soldier put a crown of thorns on his brow or on his forehead. The crown of thorn has three and a half inches thorn. So it poked into the skin and the blood came out from his brow or his forehead. And we are set free by that blood too. What does it mean, the blood that come out from his forehead? What was the purpose of that shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ? The first one at the whipping post to break the curse of sickness. This one to break the curse of poverty. Before Adam sinned against God, there was no lack at all in the Garden of Eden. God said that you can eat from any tree. Our God is a God of abundance so much. He created many kinds of fish. He created many kinds of banana. He created many nationalities. When you look at the fish in the sea while you're snorkeling, you can see, wow, God is a generous God. God is a God of abundance. Amen. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had abundance. They had more than enough. But after Adam sinned against God, the curse of poverty creep into the world. And look at what God say in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, and for dust you are, and to dust 
you will return. So the Bible talking about working hard, but sweating from the brow, but not enough, and eventually die. And look at what God said in verses 17 and 18 in Genesis chapter 3. Then to Adam, he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I command you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns, everyone say thorns, and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. Thorns and thistles are symbolic of poverty. Adam has to work hard to gain income. He used to have a good life of prosperity, but now he has to suffer working Try to earn income. And God talking about the sweat from the brow. Talking about the thorns that represent poverty and financial hardship. The crown of thorns on the head of Jesus caused the shedding of his blood to break the curse of poverty. Amen. Everyone say the curse of poverty is broken. As Christians, do we have to stay poor forever? No. I'm not saying that you're going to be a millionaire. But I'm saying that you're going to have more than enough. Your needs will be met. You will not be in lack. Amen? So every morning when you wake up, you can claim. You can say, the curse of sickness cannot be upon me. The curse of poverty cannot be upon me. And whatever I touch, I have faith and I obey the word of God, shall be successful. God will bless the work of my hand. I will not be in lack. I will not stay in debt forever. I will pay my debt off. I am blessed by the Lord. Amen? And it's not because of you're good, but because Jesus shed his blood at his brow here. Look at the third place where Jesus shed his blood. This one to redeem us from the power of darkness. When Jesus was hung on the cross, the soldier put nails into his hand and into his feet. According to the Bible, the word hands represent many things. I don't have time to quote all the scripture. If you want to understand and learn in detail about the hand or laying on of hand, Please go and get the CD series called The Laying On of Hand and listen in detail about the hand of God. Every time we lay hand, we represent God to lay hand on people. In the book of Exodus 14, 31, Deuteronomy 34, verse 12, the word hand in the Hebrew language is translated as great power or mighty hand. The word yard in the Hebrew language means mighty hand, means power, it means authority. In the book of 1 Kings chapter 18, the word, the hand of the Lord, means the presence of the Holy Spirit or the anointing. So the word hand represents authority or the presence of God. When Adam sinned against God in the Garden of Eden, before he sinned, he received all the dominion to rule the world. God said, go and multiply and fill the earth. And I give you dominion over the fish of the air, Oh no, the the bird of the air, not the fish of the air. The birds of the air, I want to see that you are sleeping or not. And the birds of the sea, and the the, the fish of the sea. Are you awake? Okay. You're awake. (laughs) The birds of the air and the fish of the sea, he has dominion. But after he rebelled against God and he obeyed the deception of the devil, the authority was transferred to Satan. Satan is called God of this world. So in other words, those who are not Christians are controlled by Satan, are controlled by principality and evil spirit. After we give our life to Jesus, we change the Father now. Our Father is not Satan anymore. Our Father is Jehovah, God who created the heavens and the earth. Because as human being, the first Adam lost his authority to Satan, and now we become a Christian We know Jesus. We have relationship with Jesus Christ. Somebody has to redeem and pay for us to get that authority back to us. So Jesus shed his blood at his hand, his wrist and his hand, which represent authority. So he tried to tell us that he paid the price. He shed his blood to redeem the power back to us. And now we can have power over darkness. We can command the devil to go away from our life. Amen? I love to cast out demons. And I cast out demons a lot. When I went to Germany, I cast out a lot of demons. And when I went to Thailand, I cast out a lot of demons. I love to cast out demons. But by the way, I just want to be clear here. You listen to the CD series called 
your unseen enemies, how to cast out demons. But we don't do this, okay? We don't pray to challenge Satan. Call Satan come down, and I want to fight with you. There is no such thing in the Bible to pray and challenge principality and Satan and all this evil spirit to come and say, "I'm gonna fight with you. I'm gonna challenge you right now." Don't pray that prayer, okay? That is a wrong kind of prayer. We don't challenge the devil. We just say, "Go away in Jesus' name." We use authority to command them to go away, but don't challenge them. Don't curse them. Don't say bad words against Satan. It's not our right to do that. It's only God can do that. Amen. So many Christians are in trouble, get afflicted by cancer, by problems because they challenge Satan, and then Satan say, "Okay, you challenge me, I come and attack you right now," because we did not follow the Bible. We need to follow the Bible. Amen. So we have authority. That hand shed the blood to redeem the power over darkness back to us. But it doesn't stop there. The nail also went into his feet, and the Bible say in Joshua chapter one verse three. Every place that the sole of your foot would tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. Jesus shed his blood from his feet in order to gain back the authority and the victory. That wherever we go, we step our foot on, we will have victory. He paid the price for us. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter six, verse fifteen, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Everywhere we step our foot and preach the gospel and proclaim the gospel, lay hand on the sick and cast out demon. We have authority, and God give that place to us. Amen. So hand authority, feet preaching the gospel go out with victory. Jesus paid the price to redeem us from the power of darkness and brought back the power and authority so that we can preach the gospel. Amen. Let's say thank you, Jesus. So that's the third place. Number one, at the whipping post, the curse of sickness is broken. The second one, the crown of thorn, shed his blood under his brow to break the curse of poverty. The third one, his hand and feet to redeem, to bring us back authority and power over darkness. Number four, John chapter 19 verse 34. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. Immediately, blood and water came out. If you are not a doctor, you may not fully understand why the soldier have to put the spear into the side of Jesus, into his heart. Normally, when a person is crucified on the cross, it would take many, many hours, maybe a day or two, before that person pass away. The person pass away because of lack of uh, oxygen. When you on the cross like this, every time you breathe in. You have to push your body up, and your feet are hurt. Every time you breathe out, your body go down, your hand hurts. So eventually, you suffocate because it's hard to breathe in and breathe out. Number two, you don't have any water. You're burned by the sun of Palestine, and the bird will come and pick your eyes and pick your body. They come and eat you. So it will take maybe. At least one to two days before you pass away in bad, severe suffering of the cross. But Jesus gave up His spirit. He gave up His life within only six hours. In other words, no one killed Him. He gave up His spirit to pay for us. By afternoon of that day, Jesus already died on the cross. Normally, people took time. To die longer, and because that day, just before the Sabbath day, the Jewish religious people say we don't want these people to die on the Sabbath on Saturday, so they ask the soldier to kill these people very fast. The other two robber or two prisoners, the soldier know the physiology of human being, so they come in with a stick and hit on the leg of the prisoner or the robber on the cross. The other two. So that the legs will be broken. So when your legs are broken, you cannot stand anymore. What happened? You suffocate. You cannot breathe in. You cannot push your body up to breathe in, and you lack oxygen in your lung, and you die faster. That's how they kill the people on the cross faster. But when they came to Jesus, they realized that Jesus already stopped breathing within six hours. In order to prove that Jesus died for sure, they have to put the spear into his heart. 
and the blood would come out. How do you know that the heart stopped beating already, died or for a while? If you understand medical knowledge, if you draw the blood from the vein, the blood contains serum or water and red blood cell. So the serum and red blood cell, they all mix together as the heart is pumping, pumping. The serum and red blood cell will mix all the time. So when you draw the blood out, it looks just red blood, red water. But if you put that blood into a container and leave it for five minutes, the red blood cell will go down to the bottom and leave the water at the top we call serum. You can see two layers of blood and serum at the top. So when the heart stops beating for a while, inside is a container. So the blood will go down and the serum up top. When you put the spear in, you can see the serum come out and then followed by the blood. So the soldier knows right away that he died already for at least five minutes because the red blood cell come to the bottom of the heart. Now you understand why they did this. He shed his blood through the heart. His heart was broken. His heart was pierced. He shed his blood through the heart. And remember Jesus say, I come to heal the brokenhearted. Many of you might have been abused when you were young. You may be sexually abused by somebody. You may be physically abused. You may be hurt by your ex-husband, ex-wife. You may have broken heart, hurt, wounded spirit. People may have wounded spirit because they got rejected since they are young. Do you know that baby is inside the womb, knows what's going on outside? And if the parents reject that baby inside, the baby could detect and they have a wounded spirit. That's why some people come to church whose father deserted them when they are young or maybe they were born with rejection of their parents. These people, when they come in, you notice that they have kind of interesting personality. They're looking for recognition, looking for people to talk to them. And if people don't recognize them, they will throw the tantrum and say things and try to show off, you know, I'm great. Why? Because they are wounded inside the heart. It's broken because of rejection from young age. And God wants to heal you. It's not healthy to have a wounded spirit, a wounded heart. A broken heart, bitterness and unforgiveness and feel rejected all the time. You're going to show out in your manner and your personality. And it's not good for you. God wants to heal your heart. And the blood of Jesus Christ can heal your heart. Amen? If you recognize that you have the wounded spirit, a wounded heart, let the blood of Jesus heal you. Move on. Forgive those who reject you. Forgive your parents that rejected you. Forgive those who hurt your feeling in the past. And move on into the confidence that Jesus loved you so much and you are a son and a daughter of God. God never rejects you. God loves you. Get out of that mode of wounded heart and wounded spirit and rejection. Amen? Everyone say, God died for me to heal my broken hearted. That's number four. Number five, look at where Jesus shed his blood. Actually, the first place that Jesus shed his blood was in a garden. It's interesting. I don't think it happened by accident. The place that Adam did wrong thing was in the garden called the Garden of Eden. And the last Adam, Jesus, shed his blood the first time in the garden as well. It's the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember the story? In the Garden of Eden, God told Adam, you can eat fruit of every tree in this garden. Abundance. All kinds of tree. Mango, rambutan, Durian. No, I'm talking because I'm Thai. So I came from Southeast Asia. Apples, orange. You can eat anything in the Garden of Eden, but only one tree. You should not touch the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. If you notice, God always has something sacred to him that you should not touch. The Bible says, don't touch that tree, the knowledge of good and evil. Don't touch my anointed. Don't touch my prophet. And don't touch my 10%. If you touch, you're in trouble. Don't touch the 10%, don't touch my prophet, don't touch the anointed, and don't touch that tree. And in the garden, Satan or the serpent deceived Eve. He used cunning word to deceive Eve. And Eve was deceived and touched the fruit and ate it. And after that, she handed the fruit to her husband. In fact, the husband should be the covering and say, oh, no, 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 no. God told me not to do this. Don't do it. He should have protected his wife. Adam did not listen to Satan himself. Adam willfully took the fruit and ate himself. He used his willpower to do it. He broke the law of God out of his own willpower. 
At that time, he gave his flesh and his willpower to Satan, and after that, he is under the control of the sinful nature. When you are born again, your spirit is born again, but your flesh is not born again. You still have the flesh. Your willpower is not born again either. You notice why so many Christians still sinning, still have a lot of bad thinking and doing wrong things. It's easy to tell a smoke addict person, say, "Stop smoking! Stop smoking!" It's easy to say, but it's hard to do because the willpower of that man still under the oppression of Satan. It's easy to tell people, "Stop lying! Stop cheating! Stop loving money!" But the willpower inside still love money, still yield to the devil. In the Garden of Eden, Adam say, "Not your will, but my will." His flesh rise up, his willpower rise up. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, why Jesus was praying, he say, "If possible, take this cup away from me, but not my will, but your will." Opposite. And the Bible say in Luke chapter twenty-two, verse forty-four, and being in agony, he pray more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great. Drops of blood falling down to the ground. The sweat that came out from Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane came out as blood. He was in the intense agony, even though he was God hundred percent and he was a man hundred percent. As God, he knew that he has to go through such a severe agony. He gonna be whipped, spat on, crucified on the cross, suffer so much. He knew that he was gonna go through. Very severe agony, so he sweat into the blood. The blood vessel in his skin broke because of the severe suffering that he has to go through. Jesus shed his blood in the Garden of Gethsemane to save you, to pay for you. That from now on you can have victory in your willpower. That you can start to say to God, "Not my will, but Your will." He gave this power to you so that you can overcome your flesh by the Holy Spirit. So, as Christian, we can choose to live by the Spirit, not by the flesh, because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We can say no to sin and say yes to God. When the pornography come up in the internet, you can say no. I turn it off right now. I'm not going to yield to this pornography. When the thought come in, commit adultery. You can say my willpower. I submit to the will of the Father. I submit to the Holy Spirit, and I say no to the thought of adultery. You can overcome in your willpower and your flesh. Amen. Is it good that God give us that power? Just give the mighty hand of the praise to God. You don't need to be a weak Christian. You can rise up in faith by the Spirit of God and say, "By the blood of Jesus Christ, I yield my willpower to the way of God, to the will of the Father." Amen. That's the fifth place. Let's look at the sixth place where Jesus shed His blood. Isaiah fifty-three verse five. But He was wounded for our transgressions; He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. I want you to see these two words: wounded and bruised. When you are wounded, this morning Pastor Da has to do something, and then. The metal cut into her finger, and she bled. The blood came out from her finger. She was wounded in her finger. The blood came out. The Bible say Jesus shed His blood from inside to outside for our transgressions. What is transgression? Transgression means breaking the law. It means you sin against God. When we sin against God, we have to pay for that sin. And the blood of Jesus come to forgive and to wipe out that sin from the stain of sin into as white as snow. Every time you come to Jesus in repentance and confession of your sin, and ask the blood of Jesus to cleanse you, He will look at you as white as snow. It's not just have a white out to cross it out or just cover it. It's not just covering, but it's completely gone, wiped out as white as snow. Each of us sin against God every day, and every day when we repent and ask God to forgive us and cleanse us by the blood of Jesus, we become righteous again. God wipe out all of our sin, and we become righteous. That is your own sin and my own sin. That Jesus shed His blood through His wound to wipe out our sin. But He was bruised. Let me read the scripture, and you understand why He was bruised. Exodus chapter thirty-four, verses six to seven. And the Lord passed before Him and proclaimed, "The Lord, 
the Lord God merciful, merciful and gracious, long suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. This Bible talk about this part of the Bible talk about iniquity. The Bible says he was bruised for our iniquities. What is the difference between transgression and iniquity? Transgression, you break the law, you sin, and God wiped it out by His blood. But iniquity means the inner inherited weaknesses. You have that nature inside you, the weaknesses. Each of us have different kind of weakness. Some of us. The weakness may be sexual immorality. Some of us may be loving money. You're willing to even lose your family to make a lot of money because you love money so much. And that comes from your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather. If your father love money, you have that iniquity, the inner weakness of loving money on the inside of you. Some of you may be lying. You love to lie. That is your iniquity. Some of you may be child abuse because you were abused by your father. So you practice child abuse to your own kids too. Slap them, knock them down. This iniquity, the weakness, follow from generation to generation. It's inside. When Jesus was bruised, he bled on the inside. Bruised means bleeding on the inside to set you free from the generational iniquities. Amen. And you can be set free from all these weaknesses if you have faith and allow God to cleanse you by the blood of Jesus to set you free from all these iniquities. Pastor Da can witness that God has set me free from many iniquities in my life that come through generation. If I look back in my previous generation, my dad, my grandfather, my great grandfather, there's so many mess up in there. But God already set me free by the blood of Jesus Christ, and you are the candidate. To be set free from the curse of iniquity by the bruise of Jesus, by the internal bleeding of Jesus Christ. The sixth place: internal bleeding, the bruise on the inside. In conclusion, you can be set free from the curse of sickness. You can live a healthy life. Definitely, you need to repent and have faith in the blood of Jesus. Two, you can be set free from the curse of poverty. Three, you can regain back the power. And receive the power over darkness. Number four, you can be healed in your heart, the broken heart. You can also have supernatural victory over your own willpower and your own flesh by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. You can say no to sin and say yes to God every single day. And the last one, your iniquities can be wiped out by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't need to live a sinful life like your parents, your great grandparents anymore. You don't need to be a drug addict. You don't need to be practicing sexual immorality and committing adultery like in the past generation. Yes, you have to repent of your sin, and Jesus shed His blood for your transgressions. But the iniquity on the inside can be taken away from you by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. How many people believe in the power of the blood? Amen. And that is what he paid for you. He paid for you, but you need to take it by faith. If I pay off a house for you, this is Eve, okay? If one day I see a nice house, I say, okay, I'm gonna pay cash for that house and let you stay in there for free and change the name to you. You can own that house. I pay already, and you say I don't believe it. Will you get into the house? What you need to do? Number one, you need to believe that I pay for you. So first step is to believe. Second step, you need to come to me and say, "Give me the key," because I hold a key. Is that right? You need to get the key, and not only that, you need to go to the house, open the door with the key, and walk in. So you need to do something about it. You cannot just say, "I believe," and done. You need to believe. You need to get the key. And what is the key to open the door of blessing? I would like to read to you the key of opening the door for the blessing in the practical way. Who is the agent? Who is the key? To bring the blessing to you, let's look at Galatians chapter three, verses thirteen to fourteen. Galatians chapter three. You need to get the key, verses thirteen to fourteen. 
Christ has redeemed. He shed His blood. He paid the ransom already us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, "Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree." That listen carefully. Who is the key? The blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Everyone say the Spirit through faith. You have faith, and you come to God to receive the key, and that key is the Holy Spirit. That's why the church need to allow the Holy Spirit to move and touch people. And when you let the Holy Spirit come, He come in and take away the spirit of iniquity. Some of you may have the spirit of sexual immorality inside you. By faith, you can be set free. But the agent, the person, or the key that can take that spirit out of you is the Holy Spirit. He can do it because Jesus already paid the price for you. Non-believers, you cannot cast out demon. Holy Spirit will not take demon out of them because they don't have the blood of Jesus on them. But as a believer, we have the right to take all the bad spirit, all the curses, the sickness. Who get the sickness out of you? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is everything for the church. He is the agent, the key to the church. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your teaching today about the blood of Jesus Christ, the redemptive work through His blood. We believe that it was paid for. It was paid for. It was done deal, and we want to receive, it. and we want to, Lord, cooperate with the Holy Spirit that you can do whatever you want in our life. You can take away the bondage, you can take away the sickness, take away and heal the broken heart, the wound in the heart. You can pour the blessing upon us, Lord, Holy Spirit, and we're gonna come and connect to you, fill with the Holy Spirit, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. We pray, Amen. If you are not a believer, I like to encourage you to change the Father from Satan to God, who created the heavens and the earth. I used to be a non-believer. I was born in a Buddhist home. I used to worship idols, but 30 plus years ago, I gave my life to Jesus, and I'm so thankful that American missionaries went to Thailand and preached the gospel to me. That's why I come to know Jesus. Now God sent Thai man. To America as a missionary, you send missionary to Thailand. God sent Thai man to America to preach the gospel. Amen. I would like to invite you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you are not sure that you are a son and a daughter of God, very simple. Jesus said that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. You need to confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. Right now, Amen. How many people want to be saved? How many people want Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Not Satan anymore. How many people want the curse to be broken in your life? You need to speak it. You need to believe and speak, Amen. Speak with me. Believe in your heart right now. Touch your heart and say, "I believe." Now I'm gonna speak. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the shedding of the blood of Jesus. I believe. And speak with my mouth. I believe in my heart that Jesus shed His blood for me. He wiped out my transgressions. He removed my iniquities. He gave me willpower to overcome sin. He break the curse of sickness. The curse of poverty, and He handed me the power, authority, to rule and to reign in this life. Lord Jesus, by Your blood, my heart is healed. Remove the wound from my heart. I am set free. And when the Son set me free, I am free indeed. O oh Lord Jesus, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you are my Lord and Savior. 
you were raised from the dead on the third day jesus become my god become my lord and sit on the throne of my life from today on you are my lord it's not my will but your will be done i am your son and i have the right to speak the name of jesus to pray in the name of jesus and i will do your will and i become your friend thank you lord for the holy spirit thank you lord that on that day when you die on the cross the veil in front of the holy of holies was torn into two and the holy spirit came out to the well in me from today on may the holy spirit work in my life set me free from all the curses all the sicknesses and deliver me from the evil ones anoint me to preach the gospel in the mighty name of jesus i pray Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's give the mighty hand of praises to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We trust that this message is ministered to you. If you would like more information about New Hope International Church or other teaching CDs, please contact us at two zero six two seven five one zero four two. You may also visit our website online at www.newhopeinternationalchurch.com. To them all gathered in your name.